Well, happy Father's Day, everybody. Woo, I'm hot today, aren't I? Did I blow out anybody's eardrums there besides Ken's? Woo, it's all good. Well, happy Father's Day, and uh, we're just excited that you're here this morning. I know a lot of you are ready to get out on the water. Um, hopefully not as much water as came down on us last week after the service. Man, can we just say thank you to a couple guys? I know that our deacons really just stepped up last week and helped people get out of their cars. They got soaked trying to help people with umbrellas and getting blown over by the 30, 40 mile an hour winds. Our deacons stepped up. They are awesome dads here at Anastasia Church Elkton, and we're just so thankful for them and, and, and how they serve this family together. I don't know about y'all, but did your dad ever give you an earful of corny jokes when you were growing up? I mean, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, just those jokes that you just kind of say. So I don't know about you, but uh, here's one. How do you catch a deer with no eyes? Ah, it's, okay. <laughs> Woo! That's not how you catch a deer with no eyes. How? How? Come on, some of you, this is like one of those dad jokes. Ah, there it is. See, right there, he's got that one all the way. Okay, how about this one? When a dad comes up to you and says, does your face hurt? You say, no. And your dad says, what? Well, it's killing me. Yep, there you go. Sam Bodo gave us that joke, all, all those, our students, they, that was one from his dad, so all good. So how about this? Why was the ant confused? Oh, gosh. Okay. Why was the ant confused? Okay. I think I heard it. Because all of his uncles were ants. Some of you are still trying to get that one. It's all good. Yes, I know. It's all good. I only have a couple more. Only have a couple more. Just, just grin and bear. Grin and bear, okay? Um, so I don't know about you, but, you know, when you tell your dad, especially when you're younger, you're all excited because, you know, not all of us kids, you know, have the greatest hygiene, right? So when you actually do kind of listen to your parents and you go up to your dad and say, I'm going to go take a shower. And then your dad replies back, okay, but put it back when you're done. We only have one. Gosh, y'all are tough. <laughs> y'all are tough. I mean, they're dad jokes. I mean, like a dad bod, you know what I'm talking about? Not always the, you know, anyway, just moving on. Okay, all right, last one, last one. What did the baby corn say to the mama corn? Yes! Where's popcorn? What did the baby corn say to the mama corn? Where's popcorn? Gosh. I mean, that was the lieutenant colonel of all corny jokes right there. Let that one sink. Let that one sink a little bit. Let that one sink. So, okay, now that that's over, I promise I, I, the corny jokes will hopefully go away um, from this point on. So, but uh, as we kind of move into our, our message this morning, we've been walking through a series called Faith That Works, okay? And I don't know about y'all, but it just seems that, you know, Christianity today and in our lifetimes, it just seems like sometimes, gosh, am I just spinning my wheels? Does this really make a difference? Is this Christian thing just something that I do for my parents or is it something that I do because, you know, America is a Christian nation or, you know, my family or my generations or because it's just what I'm supposed to do on Sunday or does this really work? Well, that's what we've been walking through. We've been looking through the book of James and, and for the last few weeks, we've been doing a few, few things. First of all, we introduced the author of the book of James, who is the brother of Jesus and he actually walked through faith that it was a process for him because first he had to deal with God's provision through famine. And I don't know about y'all, but when you can't eat, faith shows up, right? When you can't eat, when you're struggling with even the necessities of life, 
that you have to just trust God through that. But then not only that, the brother of James also had to deal with resolution because the church was going through conflict. There were, there were people, especially those that were Jews originally, and they'd become to know Christ, and so they were telling them that, you know, you've got to do this. You've got to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G in order to then accept Christ, to, to be a full-fledged Christ, in order to be a full-fledged member of our church. You've got to do all these kinds of things. And so he was dealing with that conflict, and how do you bring a church together of people, especially when two humans show up, they're going to be what? There's going to be conflict. And so he's working, how do you deal with that resolution, that being a peacemaker in the midst of it all? But then we also then finished with how he had to deal with perseverance through persecution. Because for James, in that time period, you're talking about the church from the outside, but then also from the inside of people that were saying, you know what? If you represent Jesus Christ, you're putting your life on the line. The church was being killed off by the world around it, and by some, even some within that were felt like that their power was being taken away. So here he is, his faith is being tested. His faith is, is something that he's having to deal with all of these trials. And so last week we then moved into this faith that then matures, that we, we don't just have faith like a child, which is great, that's what Jesus calls us to do, that we come before him and we trust him, by faith, not by what we see, not by what we touch, but by faith we put our lives into his hands. But then we see that maturity of our faith happens as we endure. It's not about all the memorizes, the verses that we memorize, all the, the, the various service opportunities that we take advantage of, all the life groups and the Bible studies that we go to. Those are good things. But when it comes to faith that matures, that becomes complete and perfect, Christ showed us that it is about the endurance of that. It is that which you trust him and you wait upon the Lord for him to renew your strength. And so this morning as we continue in the book of James, we're going to ask this question. How do we hear God in all the noise? Right? How do we hear God in all the noise? Right? When, when you're like trying to use a microphone and you want to test it out, what do you say? Testing. 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 One, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This morning, there's some of us that are going through tests. We're going through trials. We're going through things in our lives that we wouldn't sign up for, that we wouldn't put our name on the dotted line to say, okay, I'll take that. And you're being tested through those trials. And this morning, I'm going to give you one, two, three things from the book of James in chapter one that help us to understand what God and how he's trying to speak to us so that we can hear his voice. If you don't mind, let's stand in honor of God, let's know that this love letter that he's given us, that the Bible is his map, is the map. And as we look at James chapter 1, we're going to see how we can hear God in all the noise. It says this, James chapter 1, starting in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer but forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's pray. Wow, that kind of just steps on our toes, God. Lord, so there's some things there that just digs deep. And Father God, we're just asking that your spirit this morning would speak into our lives, that we would hear your voice and not Mason's because we need you. Lord, I pray that you would empty me, that Father God, that instead that it would be your word that 
just is very clear, that resounds in this place this morning, that you would echo over and over and over again into our lives all throughout the week, and that this morning as we listen to you, Father God, that we would then be ready to not just be hearers, but be doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, talking about not being able to hear, does anybody know what one of these is? Can you see this? There's a picture of it right there on the TV as well, right? Anybody ever had to use one of these things? This is what you call an ear syringe. I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the, the easier of the two things that you can e- use this for, okay? An ear syringe, okay? And so, I don't know about y'all, but man, I have really small ear canals. It's one of the things. I might have a big mouth and a long tongue, but I got really small ear canals. And you could just ask my wife how much I really need to like hone in to listen to her instead of it going in one ear and right out the other, right? And so, but when it comes to being able to hear everything that's being said, these are very important to me because I get a lot of buildup I get a lot of buildup. When it comes to just the way that that my my body um, works, that when it comes to all that junk that gets in your ear, it builds up for me and I have to regularly remove the earwax, right? Because this is something that if I don't, it's it's like, you know um, Snoopy? Remember back in the day, Snoopy, Charlie Brown? Right? This is what all the adults sounded like when Charlie Brown was talking to the, t- when the teacher was talking to Charlie Brown, right? Well, when your ears get clogged up, that's what everybody sounds like. And so in order for us to first be able to hear, there is a place at which we need to take a step. And that first step is to remove your earwax. And I'm like going, where in the world are you getting this, Pastor? This is like, this is really gross, Right? I'm only building off of what the Word of God is, okay? And, and yes, I found out at an early age that, you know, those Q-tip things that some people do, I, what I would do is I would just impact it more. I would stick that thing in there and you just clog it up more, get it more built up in there, and then more, I mean, it would just get bad and bad and bad. But then eventually a doctor finally figured out what the deal was, and he shared with me um, you know, some people use something called Debrox. There's all a bunch of different kind. But once they showed that you could take this stuff in, you could get all that filthiness out of your ear with dr- some drops. And then you had to put this in some warm water, and then you just flushed it. You squeezed it out with that warm water and just got it all out. Well, guess what? In this passage, it uses the word filthiness. And that, in the context, is actually a medical term that means wax in the ear. Crazy. When it comes to walking through and looking at, this is a word picture that here was used in this time period that James then follows up and basically says that sin in your life plugs up your desire to hear God. All right? Your sin separates you from God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your father and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. It's really interesting that as we consider this, Proverbs 28 then says, whoever conceals his transgressions with will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Here's the thing when it comes to us, when it comes to our selfishness, when it comes to our pride, when it comes to things that I want to do instead of what God's called me to be, or the things that he's called me to be that I then choose not to do, that that then creates a place of not being able to hear clarity in the direction that God wants to give you in your life. Think about this. In the context of trials and and hardships and suffering, how do we react to those challenges shows the evidence of our identity. How many times have you seen somebody that when it comes to their their walk with Christ, when it comes to them being a Christian, 
that we see that, you know, initially, man, this person just, I mean, they, they hear about the Lord. They come to, you know, they, they make a decision, seems like they've made to Christ. You know, they, they get really excited. There's a lot of joy. There's a lot of this. But then all of a sudden, persecution hits. Trials. Testing hit. And in the midst of that, they fall away and they don't produce the long-term fruit of those that have the implanted word of God, which is the good soil of God's voice in their life. Church, I want you to hear this. And not just hear it, but listen. This is so hard, even for me as a pastor. That phrases like slow to speak, slow to anger, Bridle your tongue. They help us to understand that, you know what the noise is most of the time? That one of the reasons why we don't hear from God is because we're the ones that are making the noise. It's our voice that's blocking us from hearing God's voice. I mean, think about that. How often that instead of being slow to speak, that we're quick to talk. How often that when it comes to that which our emotions start to get the best of us, and instead of being one that waits, that we overreact. And it just comes volcanically erupting out of us instead of being that slow to anger. In the midst of hardships, do we criticize the faults of others? Are we the first ones to grumble about circumstances or do we listen first and react last? Unfortunately, many of us react first with anger, which usually puts us, what, into even harder circumstances, more predicaments. What America needs now more than ever is a culture, and this culture of violence isn't gun control, it's tongue control. Think about this. Have you ever thought to do a background check on your motivations behind your frustrations? Think about that. Do a background check. Look into what is it that's got me so upset right now. Think before you act. Consider that. Are they selfish and prideful instead of trying to love your, your, love your neighbor as yourself? When's the last time you voluntarily enforced a 10-minute waiting period on saying anything when you know your emotions were starting to fire up? That 10-minute waiting period that you choose to do, not that you're forced to do, but you put upon yourself? Let me tell you, that will keep you out of so many more where just something gets worse and worse and worse. The only way to ban all assault spitefuls in us is to ask God to make us peacemakers and to bridle my tongue. Come before God and say, God, I need you. This right here directs me in a bunch of places that I don't need to go. This needs a bridle. This needs God's help for me to say, God, I can't do this. I need you. And I want to be slow to speak. I want to be slow to anger. And I want to bridle the tongue that I have. So that first key is to remove the filthiness in our lives. And, and that's done through confession. That's done through repentance. That's done through coming before God who loves you so much that he gave his son for you. And because of that, there isn't any filthiness in your life. There isn't anything that has impacted you over and over again that he can't then go and clean out completely. He can't flush it out. He can. And through all circumstances, God loves you so much that he gave his son for you so that your sins, no matter what they are, no matter how many they've been, and no matter how many they will be from this point on, Jesus has taken that penalty for us. So that's the first key. But the second key 
to hearing God in all the noise is to choose reception over deception. Hear this, church. To choose reception over deception, deception because hearers only deceive themselves. You know what? I, I, I mean, I get this because it's awesome that you're here this morning. I, it, it's wonderful that we're together because we're two or three are gathered in his name, then he's in the midst. But I wonder, and I, I believe me, I did this. I was in a church all the time, especially during my high school years, and I felt like just being in church was enough. If I was just there to hear what that guy set up on the platform, that was enough. But for those of us that feel that just hearing God's word is all that we need to do, ask yourself what would happen if you heard an emergency vehicle siren blaring behind you. If Officer Richards was behind you in one of his cars and you looked in your rear view mirror, you saw him with his lights on right behind you. You looked down and you saw that you were doing 65 miles per hour on 207 in the middle of Vermont Heights. How many? How much? $281 fine. Wow. Yeah, hello. That's what I'm saying, okay? As you roll down your window, you listen to Officer Richards and everything that he said. You closed your eyes and you lifted your hands in agreement with what he said. You wrote it down in your journal. You memorized it word for word. But then after receiving a warning from him, you looked back in your rearview mirror and checked traffic and then sped off going 65 miles an hour through the school zone at Otis Mason. How much would that be? A lot more, right? Woo! That's, that's like, I, I didn't, he didn't know I was going to ask him that. That's just like, that's how much he knows that. Thank you. But think and a judge, right? Because it's a school zone. Think about that. Church, that's what we do when we just hear God's word and we don't do it. We're missing out. Faith works. He doesn't want us just to hear it. The evidence of our faith is when we take a step of faith and we do it. When we engage, when we love people, when we come to that place of saying, you know what? Yes, it's wonderful that we're here today. It's Father's Day. There's a bunch of people on the water right now. There's a bunch of people doing a barbecue right now. There's a bunch of people. Thank God that you're here this morning. But please, church, know this, that when it comes to how God has designed us and what he wants us then to be is not a here that only deceives themselves because that's what we do. We deceive me. I'm deceiving myself if I think it's just about me being here and hearing it. But doers receive God's word that is what? Implanted. It's implanted in you. You see, God has given us a clear channel of reception to overcome our deception. God's word's implanted in us. Church, when you allow God's word, when you choose on your own, to be somebody that gets into God's word, that you read God's word personally, that you honestly say, God, I don't even know if I believe you, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask that you help me to listen. I'm going to open up your word. I'm going to ask you to show me, now what do I need to do about it? Think about this. Since God's word's implanted in us, that means it's internal. That there can be tons of noise externally, but we can still discern God's voice because it is from the Holy Spirit. That your circumstances can be as loud and as booming and as incredible as the world can throw at you and as the enemy tries to steal, kill, and destroy. But because God implants his word in us, because his word is that powerful, that it can well up as a still small voice. And we can then know that it's not just about hearing, it's about doing. Can I tell you what the base sound of God's will is? I mean, think about this. You know what I'm talking about? You pull up to you know, a stop sign or you pull up to a, a, a red light. All of a sudden, the guy next to you drives up and, you know, I 
I don't know, you know, if it's loud enough, that's probably a fine too, right? I mean, especially parts of the beach, you can, you can get something, you know, on that. But I'm telling you, get, check this out. Humble faith is the base thump of God's will. All right? Humble faith is the base thump of God's will. Submitting ourselves to the word means that we then apply it in our lives. How many of us have heard hundreds if not thousands of messages from God's word but then as soon as we step into our car and leave there's no change. When's the last time you read God's word or you heard God's word on the radio or on the internet or on your app on your phone and then ask did you truly then say And ask God to help him apply it into your everyday life. Have you ever asked someone you trust to hold you accountable to not just reading God's word, but more importantly, living out God's word practically at home, at school, at work? I mean, this is one of the reasons why life groups are so important here at Anastasia. Because when you submit to God's word, you understand how important it is for you to surround yourself with other people that love Jesus too. And it's their support, it's their encouragement, it's them in your hard times that they then support you, and vice versa, that in your hard times they support you, and then you support them in their hard times. And it is through those kinds of small groups that life application happens because you see it. It's not just something that comes out of their mouth, it's something that they live out. And it's caught more than taught. You see, the pounding impact on the world is when we're transformed by the Holy Spirit who produces the life change in us where only God gets the credit. It's not about Anastasia. It's not about the church. It's about Jesus being high and lifted up. It's about people going, that's only possible because God's the one that did that. When he impacts your life, When he changes you in a way that, man, I saw that guy last year. I saw that guy last week. I saw that guy just a minute ago. (laughs) But now because of the Holy Spirit, because of God's implanted word in us, there then becomes transformation. And that's done in humility. That you see the us come together and say, man, I messed up royally. Forgive me. What really matters is how the sounds of Sunday reverberate into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So yes, we need to choose reception over deception because hearers only deceive themselves and doers receive God's implanted word. But the last key from James that helps us to hear God in the noise is to this. You want to be a doer of the word? not just to hear, then listen to the voiceless. Listen to the voiceless. You know what Jesus did when he was with us? When he walked among us? You know the kind of people that Jesus went to and listened to? The broken. The hurting. The voiceless. Because no, most everybody else didn't even see him, much less hear him. I mean, why do you think in this passage that it mentions orphans and widows as the ones that are mentioned here, as being pure religion? I mean, why not the crippled? Why not the impoverished? Why not the diseased? Because, I mean, that's important too. And by the way, those could have actually been put in here, but I really believe that the re- one of the reasons why only orphans and widows are there is because orphans and widows are challenged when it comes to the relationships that are designed to help one another. You see, only those of us that are without parents or without a spouse can really understand this. But what if you were void of a support system? What if you didn't have a family? What if, what if your spouse died? What if your parents died and it was just you? And you're a kid who, what do I do now? And notice why I say listen to the voices because it just doesn't say acknowledge the orphans and the widows. It says what? Visit. It says visit. 
Orphans and widows are also the result of persecution. Think about this. This is the context of this passage. You know what's going on? The church is being killed off. People that are representing Christ are being killed. They're, I mean, they're being, they're being crucified. They're, they're being boiled in hot oil. They're being placed. You know what is actually happening? Some of these people are being put on a stake and put tar on them and then lit in order to give light to the flowers at night for the royalty. That's what's happening to the church. The people that are really representing Christ, the people that are standing in their faith, they're the one that are saying, you know what, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, so I'm going to tell people about Jesus, and then guess what happens? They get killed because of that. You're going, that's faith that works? Hello? But in that church, listen, How are we ministering to those that have gone through trials, even to the point of losing loved ones? Do we have any spiritual orphans and widows here today that because of trials in your lives, your family have walked out on God? You're still trying to live for Jesus, but your family's like, oh, this is not for me. It don't, it don't work. There are people like that. And they are orphans and they are widows. Spiritually but also the physical orphans and widows. Church, do we have a heart affection for the orphan and widow affliction? Think about this. Do we not only see them and speak a word of comfort to them, but what about supplying their needs as they may require and according to the ability God has generously given us? He's not asking you to, to give it up all. He is asking you to take that which what he's given you and bless others with it. At least your time, if not your talents and your treasures, that we love those. Notice the priority that's given in this passage. I mean, yes, when we love, when we visit, when we come alongside of the orphans and widows, then what happens? When we do the do, it helps us don't the don't. <laughs> I love that. When we do the do, when we love people, when we prioritize that which is the Lord, when we decide that, you know what, God's real in me, faith works, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to come alongside of people's lives and in their hurts and in their pains, whether it's orphans, whether it's widows, whether it's people that are, that are struggling, I'm going to love them like Christ loved me unconditionally. And when that happens, church, he then gives you strength in your weakness to then not be stained by the world. Visiting the most hurting becomes a pre-cleansing to our world staining. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Those of you that wash clothes, if you pre-stain, you know, you put the pre-cleaner on there, you know what I'm talking about? Then you put it in the washer, it comes out that much easier, right? Love Jesus by loving others, and he pre-treats you so that when the stains of the world hit you, they come out a lot cleaner. So how do we really help people to hold on when it seems that no one ever listens to them? Now, I apologize. I told you that I wasn't going to do any more corny jokes. But man, did I ever love these things when I was a kid. I love me some corn. My grandparents actually had a farm. And in the backyard, they grew silver queen corn. Put some butter on that. Oh, my goodness. I ate 32 ears of them one time. One sitting. But I still love it. Buttered corn cobs are really hard to hold. They slip right out of your hands. They are tough to really enjoy and get every one of those kernels off of that baby. Because when your hand's on the end, you're trying to hold it there, and you got that whole thing, i got to get that piece too. But if you've got one of these corn cob holders, you put them on the ends, you can spin that baby in the butter and get it that much more. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? That Some of you are like going, shut up. I'm ready for lunch. 
But you know what I'm talking about? That salt and that pepper that's in the bottom of that bowl, and you just take that butter, and you just roll that thing in the holders. You can hold on. You can get it all over that, and then you just go to chomping. Oh, my. Corn cob holders. It's the key to enjoying the whole corn. Well, guess what? Loving others unconditionally, no matter how they respond or what they give us in return, helps us to hold on to God when all else seems lost. These holders help hold on to the ear of Cobb. But you know what happens? We can hear God. He helps us to hold on to those people when we love people unconditionally. That it might get slippery, it might get messy, but he helps us to hold on. And so guess what today, men? When you leave, we got a gift for you. Every man as you leave today is going to get you some gear, a, a, a corn ear holder. Because we want you to be reminded that what you hear today, hold on to. Hold on to the word of God. Hold on to that which he loves you unconditionally. And hold on so that as other people go through the noise that this world throws at us, that they don't let go. That we don't let go. And so church this morning, do you choose faith that works? Because as our praise team comes up and allows us to be a part of not just hearing the word, but doing the word, this morning, you have a chance to not just hear the voice of God, which, by the way, is not me. It's not Pastor Mason. There's a still, small voice. There's a Holy Spirit that's knocking on the door of your heart right now. And have you let him in? Have you let the power of God become that which is your life. Church, I can tell you that there's no harder, there's no more stressful. It's not going to get easier. Matter of fact, when you come to a place of receiving Christ, the enemy steps up his game. And the stealing and the killing and destroying hits us that much harder. And he's calling for us today to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. To be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for holding on to us. Lord, you gave your life so that we could hear God. Lord, you gave your life. And on the third day, you rose again. So that even though the things around us try to snatch us out of God's hand, that he holds on and never lets go. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. That, Lord Jesus, you are with us. And you hold on. You're faithful even when we are faithless. Lord, this morning we surrender to you. Lord, we want to take a step of faith because faith works. And there's a lot of noise that's going on. And Lord God, we want to be hearers and doers of your word. Lord, we love you. Move in this place. Help us to take that next step of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand up, Maybe God's saying, you know what, hey, a relationship with Jesus Christ, a, a surrender to God, wow, that's just, I mean, I've gone to church, but I mean, to honestly give it up to him and say, God, forgive me of my sin, come into my life, I give you everything, this morning, if that's what he's calling you to do and you've yet to take that step, whether it's coming forward and, and coming and we're praying with you and showing you how you can have that eternal promise, that that free gift of grace that he gives you, 
man, please listen and be a doer of God's word. Maybe you would just step as you're leaving today that you would take and go to our next steps table in the back. We have prayer counselors that would love to walk you through the process of what it means for you to now take that calling that God's put on your life and maybe take that next step of faith in baptism or take that next step of faith in, in joining a church body that says, you know what? We're brothers and sisters in Christ and we wanna love people that are, that they need to be listened to because they're voiceless. This morning, whatever that is, whatever God's calling you to do, let's take that step of faith. Let's sing together.